Hello, health champions. I've had so many people tell me that they can't stop eating sugar and processed foods and breads and junk food and fast food because if they did, there would be nothing left to eat. They're asking, what else is there? They're so accustomed to those things. And this is really, really sad because what it means is that not only are people eating bad food, but we have entire cultures that basically eat things that aren't food at all. And we've been trained, we've been conditioned into this behavior in just the last 50 years. So every other species on the planet has been eating straight from the planet for as long as they've been around, and so have humans. But then in the last 50 years, we've been conditioned to eat processed foods with chemical flavors. We don't even know what things taste anymore. It's the chemical flavor. Their whole industries making chemicals to stimulate certain things. We have artificial ingredients, we eat preservatives, and these foods are purposely designed. They're industries that design these things on purpose just to trigger pleasure receptors. So it's not the food value that keep us eating, it's the chemicals by design. And in my videos, I talk about how the vast majority, 90, 95% of all of our modern chronic degenerative diseases like type 2 diabetes and heart disease and stroke and cancer are lifestyle problems because we're eating all this sugar, we're eating too much starch and grain, we're eating processed foods, we're eating chemicals, artificial sweeteners, trans fats, and then the solution obviously to the long-term problem is to stop eating these things and then people don't know what to do. They're saying there's nothing else to eat. Well, that's what I want to talk about today. So I'm going to go over a lot of different foods to show you how much there really is to eat of real food. And one of the most basic foods is meat. So we have ground beef, we have various different steaks, we could eat roast beef, ham, bacon, pork chops, sausage, lamb chops, leg of lamb, ground lamb, and a lot of cultures around the world also domesticate and raise goats for meat. And all of these meats are high in protein and they're very, very satisfying. So it's a good foundation for food. But now all those meats I just mentioned have gotten a bad rap because they have saturated fat. And for some reason we've been told that saturated fat is bad. But it's not about the saturated fat, it's about how the animals were raised. So if we feed them grain and hormones and we raise them in an unnatural environment, the animal is going to be unhealthy and then the meat and the fat is also unhealthy. But the biggest problem is that we have also been eating tons of sugar and grain and starches that raise insulin. And with high levels of insulin, we can't metabolize the fat. And that's the biggest problem. But if we lower insulin and we eat healthy meat and fat, then it's not a problem if it's saturated. Saturated is actually very stable and very neutral for inflammation. So it's one of the best foods that we can eat. So as long as we feed the animals their natural food in their natural environment, then the animal is healthy and it produces healthy fat and healthy protein. But there are lots more choices because there's also wild meat. And we have things like bison, moose, elk, and reindeer. And there's a population in northern Scandinavia called the Sami, who have been around since the Stone Age, basically thousands of years. And they have been herding reindeer and they have cherished and used every part of that, pretty much like the native Indians in North America used every part of the bison. We have venison, we have wild boar and rabbit. If you want to get a little more exotic, there are things like alligator, antelope and ostrich. And if you live around where I live, where we are in the southern United States, there's a group of people called rednecks. And they think that there's some delicious things you can find on the road called roadkill. So you could also eat squirrel, raccoons and possum. And then there is a version, a variety called armadillo, which is almost like a possum with armor on it. This is 
Spanish for armored little one. And there's also some other people who refer to the armadillo as a tactical assault possum. And for more variety, there is also deli meat. We have hundreds of different pâtés, salami, chorizo. We have panceta, pastrami, prosciutto. We have pepperoni, bologna, sopressata, bresaola, capocolo, jamón ibérico, jamón serrano, and Canadian bacon. Now, a lot of people have heard bad things about deli meat, and they've heard, oh, there's too much salt, and there's this and there's that. But you don't have to worry about the salt unless your kidneys have severe disease. Your body knows how to regulate salt. But basically, it's about the quality of the ingredients. And you don't want to eat just any kind of cold cuts you want to look for the good quality. So you want to look for the good sources from healthy animals. You want to make sure they don't add a bunch of sugar and chemicals and preservatives and MSG and coloring agents and so forth. But if you have a good quality deli meat without that stuff, then it's perfectly fine to eat it. And then of course there is fish, which a lot of people prefer to meat. And there's anchovy, which I'm not crazy about, but some people like that. There is bass, bluefish, carp, catfish, cod, grew up on a lot of cod, croaker, eel, flounder, grouper, haddock, halibut, delicacy, herring, king crab, mackerel, mahi-mahi, mullet. There is snapper, perch, pike, sardines, and of course salmon. And there were hundreds of different fish to choose from, but I limited my list here because I don't want to go past the slide. But just realize there's many, many different options there. When it comes to which fish to choose, you want to look for safety and quality, just like with the other animals on land. So you want to avoid the farm-raised because they're only as healthy as what they've been fed. And if they're farm-raised, they feed them just about anything. The wild-caught are going to be a better choice for the most part. And you want to avoid fish that have a lot of mercury and PCBs. And the way that you figure that out is the fish that are primarily lower on the food chain. So smaller fish like sardines and herrings, etc., they don't live very long. They don't have time to accumulate a lot of mercury and PCBs. And most of the white fish, most of the flat fish, are quite safe. The ones you want to avoid are high up on the food chain like tuna and swordfish and shark and so forth as well as fish that live for a very long time. I've done a video that talks a little bit more about that. You can check it out. And then of course there is shellfish and we have things like abalone and clam and crab and crawfish or crayfish which is a huge thing in Sweden if you're ever around there in late August is when you want to go try to find a crayfish party. Try to see if you can get invited to a crayfish party. That's quite the experience. There's langoustine, there's lobster, mussels, oysters, prawns, scallops, and shrimp. The one thing to watch for is even a lot of people who can tolerate other fish, they might have a pretty severe allergy to shrimp, even if it's not symptomatic. So if you can get that checked out, that would be a good thing. And of course, fowl or poultry is a huge staple. We have chicken, we have turkey, pheasant, goose, duck, quail, and even pigeon. And the thing to look for is with the chicken, which is by far the most common, is how it's raised. Do your best to find at least something organic and preferably something pasture raised if you have access to that. Next category is nuts. And we have things like almonds, walnuts, pecans, macadamia nuts, and coconut. And for the keto community, where they're often trying to replace grains and flours, these nuts come in handy because they can be ground up and used for baking. And also for the vegetarian and vegan community, these nuts are excellent sources of protein and fat so that you can stay on a low-carb diet not having to eat so much of the grain and starch. And all the animal products we talked about before 
are zero carbohydrates. Meats don't have any carbohydrates. But now, if we're trying to go keto, we have to start watching the carbohydrates. So almonds have 9%, so 9 grams of carbohydrates, net carbohydrates per 100 grams of food. And net carbs means that we take the total carbs and we subtract the fiber because we don't metabolize the fiber. And then there is hazelnuts, also low in carbs, pine nuts, pretty low. And then there's peely nuts and sacha inchi. These are not so commonly available in most of the world, but they're very popular apparently in the Philippines with the peely nuts. And I'm not sure sacha inchi, I think, is more like Central America. Brazil nuts are popular and common, and they're very low in carbohydrate. But for some reason in my clinic, I find that it's the most common intolerance. It's the one that most people react to of any of these nuts. Then there is cashew and pistachio. And if you're going keto, then you want to really focus on these single digit nuts. Because if you start eating a bunch of cashews, you get 27% net carbs. That's why it's so sweet and creamy. But if you're a little more flexible on your carbohydrate count, then you can certainly include some of the cashews and pistachios as well. Next group is seeds. And seeds and nuts are similar in many ways, but seeds tend to have more protein and more fiber, but less fat. And you might also eat them a little differently, like nuts you eat more like a snack, seeds you might put in something, not eat by itself so much. But chia seeds, cocoa beans or cocoa nibs, flax seed, hemp seed, very popular for smoothies, things like that. They're extremely low in, in carbohydrate and very inexpensive. We also have pumpkin seed that is tasty to snack on. We have sesame seeds, sunflower seeds, pomegranate seeds. They're very different because most of these others are high in protein and fat, but pomegranate seeds basically have zero fat and zero protein. We have caraway seeds and poppy seeds as well, and those you probably wouldn't eat by themselves. They're more like spices, really. You just add them to things. And then we have legumes or beans, things like snow peas, green beans, French green beans, or haricot vert. We have romano beans, wax beans, green peas, lentils, peanuts, and black beans, and kidney beans. And there's some controversy around beans because it's a staple for a lot of vegetarians. It's a good source of protein and sustenance. It's quite filling. But if we talk to the paleo community, paleo is a philosophy that says we should eat like our paleolithic ancestors. And if our ancestors tens of thousands of years ago had the food, then we know that it's safe for us to eat because it's been around that long. But beans haven't been around that long, so paleo people says to avoid all beans. I don't think that matters that much necessarily, but if you want to be that strict, that's up to you. Now, if you're keto, you want to go with the top half of these beans because these are basically very high in water and very high in fiber. So they're almost like a green vegetable, whereas the lower hand here are more starchy the, from the green peas and down. But it can still be an important staple, especially if you don't have to be so tight, so strict on your carbohydrate count. A lot of people like salads, and I strongly recommend them. I like to put lots of stuff in mine. And you base it on leafy greens with iceberg lettuce, romaine lettuce, Boston lettuce, green leaf lettuce, arugula, bok choy, collard greens, kale, spinach, mustard greens, and Swiss chard. Some of these on the lower half, you might want to cook a little bit more. Uh, I like to cook them if I use any of these down on the second half. The first five I love to eat just raw in a salad. And I didn't bother including numbers on these because they're all around three to four grams of carbohydrate, but they're so high in water and so high in fiber 
that there's no way that you can overeat and get too many carbohydrates on these. But there are many, many other vegetables that are very low carb, even though they're not leafy greens. We call these non-starchy vegetables. And things like broccoli, cauliflower, celery, asparagus, leek, onion, Brussels sprouts, cilantro, cabbage, parsley, artichoke, and cucumber. And these are typically about two or three grams up to maybe six or seven at the most. So these you could eat a pound of cauliflower and, and the carbs would add up a little bit, but it's very difficult to eat so much of these that you would have too many carbs. Unless you're just really going for zero carbs, then this could add up a little bit, but you can eat this pretty freely. Here's another group that there's some controversy about. They're called tubers or root vegetables. There's radish, there's rutabaga, turnips, celeriac or root celery. There's beets, carrot, onion, parsnip, potato and sweet potato. And what's the controversy? Well, most people when they say tuber or root vegetable, they think potato and sweet potato. And if you see, these have 16 grams of carbohydrate per hundred so that adds up pretty quick but then people kind of lump these all together and say you can't have any tubers any root vegetables because they're too starchy if you're on a low carb or keto diet well that's not true as you can see so everything down to carrot and onion i would say is relatively safe even on a keto diet if you're strict keto, again, you want to limit the beets, carrot, and the onion, and you want to avoid the potato and sweet potato. But if you're on a low to medium, moderate carb, then you could even include some potato and sweet potato. I do eat those from time to time. I certainly don't eat them every day, but a couple of times a week, if you're just moderate carb, is totally fine. And if you're keto, you can still eat a lot of the ones on the top half. Now, a big problem is if you've been eating sandwiches and cereal and fast food, and that's all you know, and then you give that up, it's like, what do you do? Most people can't cook, and they're unfamiliar with a lot of the things that I've been listing. But just like everything else about health and quality of life, there is no quick fix. I'm not going to lie to you. You are going to have to invest a little bit of time and effort into this, but you'll be amazed how much you learn and how quickly you make progress if you just have a goal and a strategy. So internet is an amazing resource. And if you just try one new thing every week, okay, don't hold yourself back if you want to try three new things, but if you just do one new thing every week, and then let's say that you like one out of four, then once a month you have something that you can add to your repertoire that's going to be a new favorite for you. And this is going to add on and grow very, very quickly. And as you learn to cook those things, it'll carry over, it'll spill over, and you will enhance your other recipes and you'll actually learn how to cook. And I want to emphasize that it is so worth it to do this, to become familiar with these foods and try new things because food is really important. It is an important experience of life. It provides great satisfaction when you know how to cook something and you know that you've done it in addition to that great flavor experience. And what you find is that your taste buds will change. Your taste will come back. If you've been conditioned to eat all these bland, starchy foods, you may not know why these foods are so attractive, but you will learn to appreciate them. They will taste amazing. They'll taste better than anything you've ever had before. And I've had so many people tell me that after they've started eating like this, eating real food, then the fast food and the fake food and the processed food, they taste disgusting and sugar is too sweet, and any processed food tastes like chemicals, and so on. I don't think you should eat unlimited fruits and berries, but there are several that I think that you can have once in a while and seasonally, 
and things like raspberries, strawberries, blackberries and blueberries, the berries are the most dense. They have a lot of fiber, lots of nutrients, lots of flavor and relatively low in carbohydrates. So even on a ketogenic diet you can still have a handful of berries here and there. Another great berry is called gooseberry in Sweden it's called krusbär and if you have a little more flexibility on your carbs then you could also have things like peach, apricot, lemon, grapefruit and orange. These are all under 10 grams of carbs and again I don't think that you should follow the standard guidelines that says eat more fruits and vegetables, more fruits and vegetables as if fruit was this thing that we should eat as much as possible of all the time. But I also don't think you have to cut it out completely. Uh, eat berries if you want to go keto. If you're maintaining, eat moderately of the rest. And the last one on the list is watermelon. A lot of people look at the number and say, oh, just seven grams of carbohydrate and net carbs. I got to eat a lot of watermelon. But the problem is of how much of it that you eat. If you have raspberries, you could eat 10 raspberries and it gives you some level of satisfaction. It's quite the, the tasty bite. But with watermelon, it's all water. It's just water and sugar. It's like sugar water in a cube. And I don't know anybody who can just eat like one little cube of watermelon. You're probably going to go through at least a pound of watermelon which isn't all that much and now that sugar really really adds up. So keep that in mind of how much of this would you typically eat. If you're eating keto and low carb you definitely want to know what some good fats are. If you're just eating a lot of non-starchy vegetables it's good to put some fat on. My favorites are butter, extra virgin olive oil and coconut oil. Those are my three staples. I use them all the time on a lot of different things. Then also a coconut cream, very popular in Asian cooking, in Thai cuisine especially. And also great for smoothies. I use coconut cream in tea and coffee. And cocoa butter, great for smoothies and baking. You can also use lard and tallow if you get leftovers or if you find it at a good quality. And then there's also avocado oil and this one's kind of in between because if you squeeze it very very fresh like cold pressed like extra virgin olive oil then it's a super nutritious super natural and healthy oil. But a lot of people use avocado oil because it has a high heat tolerance, high smoke point. But now we're not talking about this natural oil anymore. We're talking about a processed oil that has been filtered and processed to tolerate that high heat. So it's not a terrible, it's still much better than all the seed oils, but it's not as healthy as that whole food unprocessed raw oil anymore. And then we also have eggs, yogurt, and sour cream in the eggs and dairy section and just about any meal can turn into a gourmet meal with the right sauce. So with a good Bernays sauce which is based on butter and egg yolk you can enhance any steak meal. Hollandaise sauce is very similar but slightly different spices. It's great for vegetables and fish and eggs and things like that. Bordelais sauce is a red wine reduction sauce that is just super delicious for steak and garlic butter could be added to just about anything and then one of my favorites is creme fraiche and a lot of people don't know about this it's very popular in France especially but often in Europe overall and it's a high fat version of sour cream. I find mine at a place called Trader Joe's and sour cream usually is about 12 to 15 percent fat whereas creme fraiche is about 35 percent fat and it's really thick and creamy. So if you cook a steak and then you just kind of rinse out the pan with some water, you reduce that down and then you add some creme fraiche, you have instant gourmet sauce. Another way to enhance food is dressings and condiments. Mustard is a common favorite. We also have mayonnaise. 
Now mayonnaise is only as healthy as the oil that you put into it. And most of the store-bought is going to be canola oil or soybean oil. So those are not really that great. They probably won't kill you either if you don't use it all the time. If you use it very sparingly once in a while, then that's probably fine. But you'll be better off if you make your own mayonnaise and you use a better oil. Now the problem is if you use like extra virgin olive oil, the flavor is going to be so strong it totally takes over. And then if you use some other oil that's less flavorful, it's not going to be as healthy. A good middle of the road is often to use the refined avocado oil. So it's not like a super stellar health oil, but it's really not bad either. With my salads, I love to have oil and vinegar as a base and then I make batches ahead of time and you can be creative with all kinds of different spices to make it a little more interesting. Additional choices are things like Caesar dressing, blue cheese dressing and ranch. So there are some better alternatives out there where they're starting to use better oils. If you make it yourself, I would probably try to base them on an extra virgin olive oil unless the flavor gets too strong for you. If you buy them traditional, the regular stuff in the store, they're going to have canola oil and soybean oil in them. So do the best you can in finding good ingredients. And ranch, try to find something without MSG because the MSG is not that great for most people and it is the ingredient that make ranch taste like ranch. So a lot of people don't realize that. Without MSG, it's not going to taste like the typical ranch that you know, but you can usually find some good versions anyway. From the Middle East, we have things like tahini and hummus. And from the Latin countries, we have guacamole. All of these are, are great additions, great condiments to serve on the side. And then, of course, any type of dressing on the market, you can mock up your own version as long as you don't add a bunch of sugar or you sweeten it with something else like stevia or monk fruit or erythritol and so on. Most of the time when your taste buds change, you won't be able to stand all of the sugary commercial dressings anyway. If you enjoyed this video, you're going to really love that one. And if you truly want to master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.